Everything, everything's good? Yes, yes. Yes. Can you see okay. your slide? Can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Yeah. Perfect, okay. I'm honored to join this uh, illustrious group, and um, I've been following along with the, uh, with the other two sessions as well. Enormously impressed. And uh, I, I, just a, a quick correction. Um, as it turns out, I am no longer at Johns Hopkins. I have uh, left Johns Hopkins Center for, uh, for Health Security, and I'm now at the, uh, I have just joined on June 1st, I'll be joining the U.S. Uh, National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in the Board of Life Sciences, Professor Ibram, which you know well, and also Professor Shinwari um, as, a, as senior scientist. So I'll be joining my colleagues there uh, for um, another post-retirement job. So, um, Let's see, someone seems to have, uh, I'll just keep talking. Um, so, shall I share again? Is that, yeah, hang on. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, also, from just by each way, uh, way of introduction, Professor Shinwari uh, invited me uh, months ago to this, um, to this meeting, and I should just say that our history is, um, is almost a decade, perhaps longer, and um, I know uh, Zakta from a wonderful program with, with the uh, shared IEP, the International um, uh, Academy uh, Panel, um, uh, which was a um, education program and uh, a sort of new curriculum to, to, for, for modern, modern ways to, uh, contemporary ways to present responsible conduct of research. And part of that, and that's what's important today, is that uh, with the idea of thinking about misinformation and misconceptions in science. And so I learned quite a lot from Professor Shimori on how to think about misconceptions in science and how to actually reverse that. We won't be talking about that today. Professor Ibram, of course, um, uh, from, the, from the NIH, uh, we, uh, he has already described our history, which goes way back. Um, and as we were quite um, impressed and are very excited about the progress with the Code of Conduct, uh, the Joint China uh, and Pakistan Code of Conduct, which is the first one after many years, 20, 25 years of trying to get a Code of Conduct uh, associated with the Biological Weapons Convention. This is the one that's, that has legs and is moving forward and we're quite, um, everyone in the, in the international uh, field is quite excited about that. Right, so what I'd like to talk about today uh, is manufacturing, I'd like to stick to that, um, and the idea of building a global uh, global vaccine manufacturing capacity. And I should say that on the, this first slide, the statement here was written in 2018, 2019, um, in the context of, a pro of my first project at Johns Hopkins, which was to think about vaccine capacity for, for, global, uh, for global pandemics. So this is before COVID, we all knew it was going to happen, and we didn't know when. In 2018, I started this project, and um, we stated in our in our in our um, in our present in our uh, report that the world is underprepared for a catastrophic pandemic. One major preparedness challenge is insufficient capacity to rapidly scale up medical countermeasure manufacturing, such as vaccines. Under a variety of plausible scenarios, the global community would struggle to produce a vaccine at, or MCM at sufficient speed and scale to contain a globally catastrophic outbreak. And so this report that was not published uh, in, in its formal um, system, but uh, was, uh, we, uh, we interviewed about 45 um, uh, um, experts in the field of vaccine manufacturing and production. So some of them were scientists, many of them were actual technicians working in manufacturing, and we asked them one question, how can you make two billion doses of, um, of a vaccine? You already have the vaccine in hand. It's already been developed, proved to work. How can you increase manufacturing to make two to three uh, billion vaccine doses uh, in six months? That was our question. And they said, can't do it. To a person, every single one of these experts said, it's impossible. This can't be done. Don't even try. And um, lo and behold, you know, a year later, the world is trying to do that. So um, let's just briefly look at and remind ourselves how complicated this is. Um, in, the, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see here's the lab, you know, developing the technology and so on. Then moving into clinical trials, we've watched this whole process take place across the world with giant, with bated breath. 
and then into manufacturing, and then uh, for some details here about the seed stock from old fashioned, from the before mRNA vaccines, from a seed stock to pilot, scaling up, then fill and finish, which is putting the vaccine into, into syringes, um, packaging, global distribution. So, um, what are the issues there? Cold chipping, infrastructure, transport, access, roads, power to keep things cold, export controls, regulations, and uh, local distribution, the healthcare workers, work, workers, what's the access to care, to care, and then finally dispensing to a patient. So the little red stars are the places where we, um, where we examine the barriers and choke points um, and, um, and try to figure out how some of these choke points could be uh, surpassed. So before COVID, what was the global capacity? We, uh, in 2018, we thought that um, we looked carefully at this, and in 2006, the global capacity for pandemic flu virus was 1.7 billion doses. In other words, in a matter of months, 1.7 billion doses for pandemic flu, right, monovalent flu, could be developed. In 2015, that increased to 6.4. Some of our experts were skeptical of that, but that 6.4 billion doses um, we could be available within 12 months, but remember for flu, this comes from egg-based production. So this also factors in whether or not there are enough eggs available, literally enough chicken eggs available. This number failed to meet the WHO Global Action Plan for influenza vaccines, which required, as we all know, this magic number of 70%. Um, to receive two vaccines within six months. And, but despite this, these caveats, we know that the global capacity for pandemic and flu vaccine far exceeded uh, capacity for any other potentially pandemic vaccine, including SARS and so on. So there are basically uh, four options for the, sorry, some section is missing on this slide. I'm not sure why, so I'm just going to, uh, hang on one second, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so there are four options to scaling up vaccine manufacturing. One is um, to build uh, new capacity after an outbreak has begun. Another is to repurpose existing capacity. Missing on the slide are the idea of stockpiles, which uh, which all countries around the world are were totally insufficient for this, and we don't know what the uh, a pandemic, by, by definition, is a new, uh, is a new, uh, new organism, almost by definition. And then finally, reserve manufacturing capacity in advance of an outbreak. And um, all four of those have proven insufficient. And so um, we'll next think about then um, what some of the barriers are to uh, to scale up during a pandemic. So um, the in. In the case of the flu vaccine, there are some limited barriers. Capacity exists to cover the world. Economic barriers. Many governments already fund uh, vaccine capacity internationally, and the annual demand for seasonal flu helps in this regard. And then finally, um, regulatory issues are uh, are sort of um, are moderate barriers. Regulation imposes strict manufacturing requirements, but the annual experience every year, year after year with how to um, work with uh, a flu vaccine means that we're uh, much better at that. As far as other vaccines go, um, during a pandemic, uh, pandemic viability only for vaccines available and only if um, individuals can be reached before exposure would be useful. There are significant barrier, technical barriers. Um, it's the, difficult, the difficulty in quickly repurposing or building new capacity at scale. It's almost impossible. There are some flexible, smaller scale, smaller scale facilities can be switched. Uh, economic and uh, barriers are um, significant because of limited market incentives to invest in search capacity. And, and I know this is an issue already mentioned by both Professor Shimomori and Professor Ikram and Professor Buta about the, about the, uh, the economic barriers to global pandemic response. In the next slide, just to talk about the different categories of, of NCM, such as uh, vaccines and so on, um, the, uh, the, the biologics, uh, uh, bi influenza vaccine biologics, remember we already discussed that eggs are required, so a very select flock of hens is, is, um, is required. It's not just any egg, not the ones we buy at the supermarket. Um, the feasibility of building new capacity for in a crisis for, for influenza pandemic would be moderate. Uh, there would be some new time required, and the egg 
egg-based production is highly specific to those viruses, and um, we all know that flu, the flu vaccine processes need to be changed. Thinking about other vaccines and monoclones and so on, um, phages and antivirals, the, the cultivation of these of substances in um, huge bioreactors um, is variable and has to be carefully regulated. So uh, the idea of, um, of growing you know, 20,000 liters of a vaccine um, in a bioreactor, the solution that has to be harvested and filtered and purified, each batch has to be tested and retested and so on. Constructing these new facilities can take years. Um, and uh, the problem with repurposing bioreactors is that they are often specialized for cell type, although um, there has been some increase in flexibility lately. Then finally, um, the, the final column on the right discuss small molecules, and I, I'd like to bring your attention to that because in many ways, the marvel of the RNA vaccines is that they are small molecules. They aren't cell-based, they don't eat chicken eggs and so on, they're basically a uh, chemical compound. And therefore, we can consider them um, uh, just a, a chemical, like a chemical drug, uh, you know. So, what is um, what I find truly remarkable is that one, the efficacy uh, has been so good, um, and while manufacturing capacity is nowhere near what we need, I think one of the lessons of this pandemic is that we will increase that um, that capacity, and uh, I have some ideas that I'll talk about a bit later that um, that point out that in many ways mRNA, mRNA vaccines may may be the solution to, to future pandemics. Um, if we can put the manufacturing capacity in place. So it's much like making aspirin. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a chemical. So um, here we're thinking about uh, what some of the traditional kind of um, the, the new uh, emerging vaccine production uh, processes are. Uh, the viral vac vector vaccines such as AstraZeneca and others that um, that are being produced um, in large numbers in China and Russia and so on, very successful vaccines that are coming from other parts of the world. The D DNA vaccines are less um, uh, have, uh, have, are, are less useful so far, but the RNA vaccines are truly remarkable. And um, eliminating the need for cell culture, they're faster, simpler, more flexible, um, and more rapidly scalable. Um, one thing about viral vector vaccines, however, is that uh, is that manufacturers can produce, uh, while bioreactors are required, the uh, the adaptation of bioreactors uh, bioreactors to make to produce vaccines using viral vectors um, can be quickly shifted from uh, disease to antigen to antigen. And here's, I think, one of my last big tables, uh, and these will be available, of course, in the slides. Um, here we're thinking about um, about different kinds of um, of, of uh, solutions to um, to making vaccines more accessible and more uh, lo more locally accept acceptable. And one thing that Professor Buta said was absolutely essential is that uh, elsewhere is that low middle income countries start to develop their own local vaccine production. Some of these um, ideas are ones that we came up with before the pandemic and that people have started to talk about more and more to allow that to happen. For example, flexible manufacturing. Um, right now, the, the six basic, um, uh, the six big vaccine production companies, mostly based in the West, uh, have centralized manufacturing facilities um, that, uh, that um, so all the vaccines are produced in one place, again, usually in the West, and that are shipped out. And what we propose, and what people are quite interested in now, is the idea of having more localized manufacturing facilities that can be designed uh, in a flexible manner to use mobile interoper interoperable modules so that one can shift from, um, from uh, vaccine to vaccine. We've already discussed, I think, platform technologies, both uh, the viral vectors, such as AstraZeneca and Sinopharm, uh, and the mRNA, uh, mRNA vaccine. So these are, uh, these are viral vectors and nucleic acid using to deliver many different pro products and allowing producers to switch in a sort of plug-and-play fashion. And then finally, uh, localized distributed manufacturing. And the idea here is that there are decentralized small-scale production facilities which would include, which would include bio kits or mini labs or even 3D printers, 
And so I would propose that in the future, we may use 3D printing of mRNA vaccines uh, that, can be, uh, that can be performed locally, pandemic or epidemic, or even in just local and small outbreak, kind of small outbreaks. These are transformative improvements um, in both flexibility and geographical distribution. And uh, I think the future is bright. Uh, as long as we can, <laughs> as long as we can move the patents along, and I'll talk about that soon. Now, I just want to talk about three papers and then finish. And two of them are um, are from my group. So I'd like to right now um, actually acknowledge the people uh, in this paper. Divya Kostandi, who is a young person, very well versed in vaccine manufacturing and access um, and administration. Kelsey Lomberg, Elena Martin, Amy Shadalja, Anita Cicero, and Tom Inglesby. Crystal Watson, Matthew Watson, and myself. Um, also important in this project were Lauren Richardson and Daniel Gaspin. So this, this is the team that, um, that has been studying uh, vaccine um, production and access, and well, mostly for manufacturing and, and uh, administration from many points of view. And so this paper was published in Vaccine a few months ago, and um, in it we discussed that, again, platform technologies, flexible manufacturing, uh, and geographically distributed manufacturing. So those really are the takeaways from this short presentation, that these are the three uh, solutions to <clears throat> increasing global vaccine uh, uh, manufacturing. And then, uh, once the vaccines are made, we need to get them into people's arms. And so there are multiple, as you know, uh, drawbacks with needles and syringes, such as needing you know, trained healthcare workers and so on, fill and finish. We're running out of glass syringes, you know, running out of syringes. There are very few companies that can, that can prepare these syringes at massive scale. And of course, the problem of uh, temperature and so on, uh, the, the mRNA vaccines, although uh, they have, there are new formulations that don't need to be in ultra, in the ultra cold chain, might see to be centigrade. Um, there are um, problems with, um, with storage and so on. So what are some of the solutions? Oral vaccines, intranasal mist, and so on, and then some of the next generation technologies that are under under um, uh, that are under uh, study include micro needle array patches. So these can be handed out one at a time at the at a corner grocery store, just uh, slapped on the shoulder. These are micro needle array patches. They're small, the size of a band aid. They have thousands of tiny little micro needles that can't be felt and um, introduce the uh, and will introduce the um, antigen, the appropriate antigen by that method. Um, we integrated reconstitution administ administration devices. These are devices that could be quickly put together um, put together locally instead of um, receiving the, the vaccines already prepared. Tablets, some lit such public oral gels, next generation super fast jet injectors are under development. And then of course self-replicating RNAs. And I saw fleetingly I saw that some women had uh, discussed self-replicating RNAs um, in one of the previous sessions. I find these fascinating. I think there are a lot of ethical problems, and certainly uh, the misinformation problem will be enormous with the idea of self-replicating RNAs. But let me just remind you, the idea of um, you know, one of the problems with the mRNA vaccines now is that a rather large amount of, of relatively large amount of RNA is required for each dose. With self-replicating RNAs, it's a tiny number of a very small actual number of RNA molecules accompanied by uh, the RNA molecule representing a protein that will replicate the RNAs. But uh, it, uh, I should assure you that this doesn't go on forever. So the self-replicating process goes on for about a week in mice um, and other experimental systems. So for about a week, um, more RNAs are made, and then eventually both processes um, fade. And, that, and having having plenty of RNA available to produce antigen to induce the immune response for a week is quite sufficient. So I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing whether self-replicating RNAs um, already in development and being studied in animals ever um, ever makes it. And missing on the bottom of the slide that are the words streamlined um, vaccine administration. There, we're thinking about ways to uh, administer vaccines without without healthcare workers. The second paper I'd like to just uh, survey quickly. Um, uh, I'll just uh, talk about the. Um, this came out just a couple of months ago, which is um, building the global vaccine manufacturing capacity needed. Again, the same uh, group of people, and we had basically four recommendations, which was to expand the, the vaccine development program 
into plat platform technologies and other technologies that would allow rapid development and manufacture. We would encourage flexible manufacturing. We would encourage um, distributed, locally, locally distributed manufacturing. So each region or even each country would be able to make its own vaccine. So this is, I know, pie in the sky, but imagine that every country in the world has its own mRNA vaccine production facility. A disease comes quickly, as we know, with COVID. It took about a month to sequence the, um, we, we knew about that. We know enough about coronaviruses to know where to look, but, but uh, the sequence was available. It was published on Twitter, right? And, um, uh, and people quickly sat down and figured out what the, what the best antigens were, what the best region of the spike protein were to, uh, to, um, uh, to create these mRNA vaccines. And imagine where every country where you could do that simultaneously, and therefore the vaccines are available everywhere. And then also to prepare, we proposed, we recommended to prepare measures to resume, reduce timelines associated associate with regulatory requirements, and that includes testing. And we know that phase one and phase two were overlapped, or phase two and phase three were overlapped, and we really were able to find, uh, to, to te test these vaccines safely in, um, in a much shorter period of time. The final paper I'd like to, uh, to discuss is Greg Gonzalez and Gavin uh, Yambi, who, um, who uh, acknowledged the uh, advantage of the, of the COVID-19 vaccine patent waiver. The U.S. You know, made, has made some intimations from the administration that they will uh, allow that temporarily. Um, these two researchers um, point out that, that while the waiver is a, is a crucial step, there are um, other steps required. So we, uh, many of you I'm sure have already been hearing about COVAX, which is a full solidarity mechanism that WHO, Gavi, um, and CEPI put together, aiming to vaccinate all high-risk people and health workers in every single nation um, in this year of 2021. Uh, this has failed, and one of the reasons this one of many one of the reasons it's failed is the uh, the courting of vaccines by rich countries. Um, that's not the only reason, but it's a major reason. So uh, I we th these two authors and myself we support the People's Vaccine Campaign, which is led by the People's Vaccine Compliance. It's a co coalition, global coalition of organizations from around the world, including UNAIDS, um, Amnesty International, Public Citizen, and a number of others. You can go on their website, which is peoplesvaccine.org. Um, and Gonzalez and Yami, the authors of this uh, British Medical Journal paper, call on Gavi, WHO, and SEPI to join these partners and think bigger and boldly. The first step is the waiver, which looks like we're starting to, to make some headway there. We know that, for example, um, while, uh, while the uh, Gates, for example, um, uh, the Gates Foundation and, and Bill Gates specifically was a, were, were you know, immediately opposed to any kind of um, waiver of intellectual property protections, but I think public pressure uh, Nancy, uh, uh, meant that uh, sorry to interrupt me. So it's a change. Nancy, sorry to interrupt me. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt me. Two more minutes uh, to conclude, please. Thank um, you. Um, and step three is the subsidization of manufacturing uh, in LICs and LICs, as I've discussed. My last slide is a quotation from WHO director. As of today, more cases have been reported, have been reported so far this year than the entire uh, of 2020. The current trends, number of deaths will overtake last year's within 